are some of the main actors who will be on the stage today. William the Conqueror is, of course, the fellow who won the Battle of Hastings in 1066 and began the Norman dynasty in England. He was also connected with some of the great churches of the day, like Jumiez and St. Etienne at Caen, Normandy, which we'll see. Although there's not much left today of the Abbey of Beck in Normandy, it was one of the main centers of Christian scholarship in the 11th century, and the first two Norman archbishops of Canterbury spent time as monks there, and the second of them was St. Anselm, one of the most important theologians of the Middle Ages, so we'll hear about him. And after the break, we'll hear about the Arab conquest of Spain, and then about the Christian reconquest of it, and in doing that, we'll hear a little bit about Mohammed and Islam. Abd al-Rahman I was the first great Islamic ruler of Spain and began the building of the mosque at Cordoba, we'll see. And Alfonso VI, the part-time friend, part-time enemy of the legendary El Cid, was one of the major figures of the 11th century phase of the Reconquista. So last time at the end of class, we were looking at the Bayeux Tapestry, and here again you see the part of that in which King Edward the Confessor is telling Harold to go to Normandy and confirm to Duke William that he is to be willed the crown of England. Since this was made under Norman supervision, at least, the story is told from the perspective of William, and if it's really true that Harold was sent on this errand, it's not one he would have wished to undertake, because he wanted to be the next king himself. Though not a blood relative, he was the king's brother-in-law and the most powerful man in England, not necessarily even excluding Edward himself. As I said last time, this so-called tapestry is some 200 feet long, and there's nothing like it in fabric art for another 300 years. This is a closer look at a later part of it, it is not technically a tapestry at all. The design was added to an already existing backing. So it's really embroidery. It's also known as Queen Matilda's tapestry on the baseless theory that it was made by William's wife Matilda and her ladies. But the more popular theory now is that it was woven under the direction of William's brother Odo, Bishop of Bayeux, and likely by monks, not women. Thomas Gainsborough called it the ugliest thing in the history of art, but it's such a venerable relic that its beauty or lack thereof is essentially irrelevant. Regardless of why Harold really went to Normandy, some think he was spying on William. His ship was wrecked on the coast and he was taken into custody by Guy the Count of Ponteux, as you see here. When William found out about this, he took possession of him. William treated Harold more as an ambassador than as a possible spy in any case, which would support the theory that he did in fact bring him good news. They visited the tourist spots like Mont Saint Michel here. We're hearing a piece of music from the Benedict Boyeran manuscript popularly known as the Carmina Burana, which as I mentioned a couple of lectures ago, Karl Orff used as the nominal inspiration for his famous work of the same name. The Benedict Boyeran manuscript is, again, one of the earliest surviving collections of secular music, but it's difficult to per perform pieces from it, difficult to know what they really sounded like to people in the Middle Ages, because they're written with staffless notes, or nooms as they're called, and any arrangement has to be regarded as very conjectural. The tides in the bay around the mount at Mount Saint-Michel are well known for being treacherous and can still be dangerous today to the unwary, despite the modern causeway to the island. Some of the men in the escort of William and Harold had some trouble, as you can see in this detail. It's just lucky they had their surfboards with them. Well, finally, Harold was apparently made to understand that if he wanted to see England again, he would have to swear to uphold William's claim on the throne. And that's what he's doing in this detail from the Bayeux Tapestry. He's taking an oath on two reliquaries, possibly from or actually in the Cathedral of Bayeux itself, 
Some think that one of the purposes of the tapestry was to make clear how Harold had sworn an oath on these relics and then broken it with the result which he deserved for his perfidy. In fact, the Pope was to support William to a large extent because of this oath-breaking. William hoped that this support would include money and men, but instead His Holiness sent him two more boxes of relics, which was disappointing at the time, although since he did conquer England, he had ultimately no cause to complain. Here now we see the death of Edward, Edwardus hic defunctus est. One of the most important sources for the history of England at this time is the Heims Kringla of the 13th century Icelandic historian Snorri Sturluson, who was also prominent in politics until the King of Norway felt that he'd betrayed him and had him assassinated. The Heims Kringla is essentially a series of biographies which constitute a history of Norway and also then of England, since the histories of the two places were closely connected for hundreds of years. An article on Snorri in the Smithsonian calls the Heims Kringla the greatest prose work of the Middle Ages. It's the source of the story I told last time about Canute playing chess. And it also says that when Edward was dying, Harold bent over him as though listening to some whisper and then stood up suddenly and said, well, I'll be darned, he's willed the throne of England to me, or words to that effect. Here's the shrine of Edward the Confessor now in Westminster Abbey. The oldest part is the 13th century lower section made in Henry III's day. It is said, however, that a coffin with Edward's bones uh, is still inside it. Whether or not Edward willed Harold the throne at his death or at any other time, Harold was in violation of his oath to William in acting on this. So here he is now on the throne, he resided Harold Rex Anglorum. Here sits Harold, King of the English, Stigant, the Archbishop of Canterbury at the right, looks exactly like he's saying, this wasn't my idea. This is an especially interesting piece of the tapestry because it shows Halley's Comet, which was visible in Northern Europe in April of 1066, soon after Harold had been crowned. Some regarded it as a good omen, others as a bad one, and Harold does look a little worried there at the right. <music> Meanwhile in Normandy, once word arrived that Harold had broken his oath, William began assembling a fleet for the invasion. He would eventually have 700 ships for 7,000 men, 4,000 horses, and lots of supplies and materiel. And now we see them sailing ad Pavensi. <music> to Pavensi, where they would land. These look a lot like Viking ships, and in a way, the fight between William and Harold was a kind of Viking civil war, pitting the descendants of Vikings who'd settled in Normandy against those who'd settled in England. Here's the beach at Pavenzi as it looks today. William's force landed here on the 27th and 28th of September and met no opposition whatever. Winston Churchill says that the English watchmen weren't alert to this because they had assumed the danger was past because it hadn't arrived yet. In any case, there wasn't much that could have been done because at the time Harold was far away dealing with another enemy, King Harold Hardrada, Harold the Ruthless of Norway who had formed an alliance with Harold of England's rebellious brother Tostig and invaded Yorkshire. Deciding that, despite the promise of imminent invasion from Normandy, he couldn't put off confronting the Norwegians, Harold marched north on September 20th and covered the 200 miles to York in five days. This is the site just east of York now, where the Battle of Stamford Bridge was fought on the 25th, 25th of September, 1066. As Snorri Sturluson tells the tale, Harold offered to give his brother Tostig Northumbria to withdraw from the alliance with the Norwegians. But when Tostig asked what he would offer to the king of Norway, Harold answered, They say he's seven feet tall? I'll give him seven feet of England for his grave. And that's what he got. <laughs> 
The Norwegians were defeated. Harold the Ruthless was killed, Tostig captured and executed. Harold then had to march immediately back to the south, arriving in London on October 1st, having marched 400 miles in 12 days and fought a desperate battle in the middle. Luckily, in the meantime, William had hardly moved. It's almost as though he thought, well, am I king now? What do I do next? He seems to have been pretty tentative. If he had lost the Battle of Hastings, everyone would now compare his caution unfavorably against Harold's energy and speed. This is where the Battle of Hastings was fought, about 10 miles from Pavenzi and north of the town of Hastings. It was fought on October 14th, so Harold's men had a few days to recuperate, I guess, but since William wasn't going anywhere very fast, it may be that in retrospect, Harold should have waited longer to confront him. When the battle was fought, the armies were of about equal size, six, 7,000 men or so, it's thought, but if Harold had waited, he could probably have gotten more men ready. Anyway, as things fell out, the battle began on the morning of October 14th. The abbey that's on the site of the battle now was founded by William after his victory and wasn't there in 1066. But the English line was about where the wall of the abbey is. The Normans came up the slope from below that. This is the view the English had down the slope up which the Normans came. The English relied almost entirely on infantry and had dug themselves in well behind a wall of shields. This is the Norman viewpoint looking back up the hill toward where the abbey is now. William relied on his Norman knights, and you see them here in the Bayeux Tapestry. At the outset, William Jongleur, Ivo Taillefer, asked for permission to strike the first blow in the battle and was granted it. He put on a spectacular display of sword juggling and then charged alone at the English and was killed. Here you can see the Norman cavalry now trying to break through the English defense, but they had little success at this. I mentioned earlier that William's brother Odo is now thought to have directed the making of this tapestry, and he was an eyewitness to the battle, having fought in it with a club rather than a sword, because as a bishop it was not permitted for him to shed blood. It's not thought possible, however, that everyone could have been wearing the expensive chain mail which we see here. The knights may have worn it, but the infantry probably had to make do with leather. At one point, it was actually thought that William had been killed, so he put his visor up to show that he was still okay. His standard bearer points him out. As long as the English maintained their discipline, they were winning, but William finally feigned a retreat, and many of Harold's less experienced recruits lost their composure and chased after the Normans, abandoning the shield wall to find themselves ambushed by the enemy. The end came when Harold himself was killed, Harold Rex Interfectus Est, it says in the Bayeux Tapestry. As Churchill puts it, he was unconquerable except by death, which does not count in honor. It has always been said that he was killed by an arrow that pierced his eye, but the only evidence for that is this picture in the tapestry itself, and some think that the fellow being struck down at the right is actually supposed to be Harold. I think the fellow at the left is supposed to be Harold, because his head sticks right up in his name, but whether or not that arrow is in his eye is anyone's guess. This is the monument that is said to mark the spot where Harold died and where the altar of William's church was then raised, not to honor Harold, of course, but rather the victory over him. Harold was actually buried at the Abbey of Waltham, which he had founded just northeast of London. The part of the church where the tomb was located was wrecked in the Reformation, and his supposed grave is now marked there by a modern stone identifying the spot. After his victory, William's subjugation of England then proceeded more quickly than one might have supposed, considering the relatively small size of his army,
The usual claim is that what worked was his ruthlessness, but in any case, he was able to pacify enough of southern England to have himself crowned in Westminster Abbey on Christmas Day by Aldred, the Archbishop of York. <laughs> back to hear more about the Normans in England in a few minutes, but this is the Abbey of Jumiege in Normandy, which was begun about 1040, and just a few months after his coronation in England, William made a special trip back here to be present at its consecration. At that time, it was at least one of the biggest churches north of the Alps, surpassing in size the Abbey of Tournus we saw earlier this quarter, which was only built about 50 years earlier. By the end of the century, Cluny would be built, and it would be the largest church ever built north of the Alps. And this progression in size is indicative of the growth of the power of the church in the 11th century, and of the growth of something like civilization, not only well before the Renaissance, but even, as again I have mentioned earlier, before what Charles Homer Haskins calls the Renaissance of the 12th century. The towers at the west end here are 170 feet high, and the nave was 90 feet high which is above average even for later Gothic cathedrals. It also had a big lantern, or what in England would be called a crossing tower, one wall of which survives at the right in this picture. This is another view of it. It sometimes suggested that the Gothic style resulted from the assembling of features from various regional Romanesque styles. Accordingly, it's often said that the two-towered facade common in the Gothic style, especially in France, originated in Norman Romanesque examples like this. It had no sculptural decoration jumiege at all. That sort of thing is said to enter the Gothic style from the Southern Romanesque, as we'll see next week. Like most early Romanesque churches, it had a timber roof, the crossing tower was to prove a much more popular feature in England than in France. Only about 10 miles south of Jumiege are the ruins, and there aren't many, of the great Abbey of Beck, founded in 1034. It became a famous center of learning in William's day, and the Italian Lanfranco, or Lanfranc as he was known in the north, who became one of William's most trusted advisors, was for several years a monk here. He had been the teacher of the future Pope Alexander II, which helps explain why the latter supported William and why he declared any Englishman who opposed him excommunicate. Some think, in fact, that Harold hurried the battle against William in hopes of preventing this dire information from spreading in England. When William took over, he installed Land Frank as the first Norman Archbishop of Canterbury. San Anselmo, another Italian who had been drawn to Beck by its reputation and land Franks, was here at the time of the Norman invasion and became abbot in 1078 and then was named to succeed land Frank at Canterbury on the latter's death, and we'll hear more about him shortly. <laughs> This is the Abbey of St. Etienne, St. Stephen at Caen, Normandy. William's marriage to Matilda of Flanders was a bit controversial because they were distantly related. They had a great-great-grandfather, Hugh the Great, apparently in common. This kind of thing wasn't always worried about much, but Pope Leo IX excommunicated them. In 1059, Lanfranc got the charges dropped, as it were, on condition that each would pay for the building of a fine abbey, and this is the one William built, sometimes called the Abbey aux Zum because it was a monastery, while Matilda's Abbey aux Dames was for nuns. The latter was badly damaged in World War II, so we'll focus on Williams. Lanfranc became abbot here after leaving Beck, and it was from here that he moved off to Canterbury, as I mentioned. William himself laid the cornerstone here in 1065, the year before the invasion of England. Here's the facade now from ground level. Again, you see the typical two-towered Norman facade. 
the spires are 13th century additions, it's interesting that without those spires, it would look a lot like Notre Dame in Paris, and Notre Dame was actually supposed to get spires like this, but never did. Here's the interior now. The nave below the vault is the original 11th century part. The vault was originally wooden, like that at Jumiege, and was replaced with Gothic sexpartite vaulting in the 12th century. The choir was rebuilt in the Gothic style in the early 13th century, so you can see the Romanesque and the Gothic side by side, as they are in fact often found. The Romanesque nave has heavy round arches and a darker, more sober, more muscular character. The Gothic choir has pointed arches, much more light and a more elegant atmosphere. We'll hear more about William in England in a few minutes, but when he died, he was in Normandy and was buried here. His distant ancestor, Rollo, who was given Normandy in 911, was called Rollo the Walker because he is said to have been too big for any horse to carry, and William apparently was up to around 300 pounds at the time of his death, and it may be in part that no one wanted to try to get his body back to England, although it's not unlikely he expressed a preference to be buried at St. Etienne in any case. We'll hear a piece of music which might have been performed in conjunction with his funeral. It's the 11th century lament for William the Conqueror. <laughs> This is what his tomb looks like today, but in the revolution, the place was ransacked and his body thrown out. It is said that one thigh bone remains. Here's another view of St. Etienne now. And this is the modern statue that honors him at Falaise, where he was born. As I said, the conquest was easier than one might have supposed it would be, which doesn't mean it was really easy, though. The Norman conquest reminds me a bit of the conquest of Mexico by Cortez, actually. It seems like no one with any sense would have thought either Hernan or William could have pulled it off. The population of England was about two million at the time, most of whom would have been hostile, and after Hastings, William's army probably numbered no more than 5,000. Malcolm Canmore, King of Scotland, sent his nominal allegiance, but Despite the claim of the anonymous Anglo-Saxon chronicle that William also subjugated Wales and that if he had lived two more years he would have conquered Ireland, Wales and a fortiori Ireland were far from pacified, far from under his control at his death. And he faced on and off trouble in England for 20 years, although the bottom line is that it wasn't trouble he couldn't handle. The chronicle also says that there was not one piece of land in England that he did not know who owned it and what it was worth and then set it down in his record. 
And that record survives in part in the Doomsday, the Judgment Day book, which you see here, one copy of which you see here, and which gave him a basis for taxation. A lot of England did, of course, change hands with the coming of the Normans. William had had to promise a lot of his men parts of England to get them to come on this expedition, which has a bit the air of a giant real estate speculation about it. He appointed 270 earls, barons, bishops, and abbots, of whom only 12 were native Englishmen. The only important English clergyman to keep his job was Aldred, the Archbishop of York, who had crowned him. One of the things which gave the Normans an advantage in the years following the conquest was the superiority of their military architecture. The Anglo-Saxons had few stone castles, and the Normans immediately began building big fortresses, some of which still survive in part all over England. C.K. Oman, the foremost English castleologist, says four survive, to a reasonable extent at least, from William's own day, and these are the ruins of one of them, Pevensey Castle, up above the beach where William first set foot in England. It was built by one of his brothers, um, created Earl of Mortain. In conjunction with his reorganization of England, William introduced the feudal system, giving men land to govern on his behalf in exchange for service when required, and demanding a direct oath of allegiance from everyone, which went a long way toward making England the first modern European state, in the sense that it was arguably the first to reach its current geographical boundaries. Also, he was at his death to give all of England to one son rather than divide it, which set an important precedent, and primogeniture would be the rule for the rest of English history. He didn't give all of his property to one son. He, he gave England to one, Normandy to another, but England passed intact to just one heir. I'm not sure how much time William actually spent in London, but it's probably fair to say that it was with his reign that it became the definitive capital of England. In this picture, you can see part of the old Roman wall on the north side of the city where the Barbican Center is now. And in William's day, the city of London was essentially inside this wall, which he remodeled, rebuilt, with the tower at the east end and the west side of the wall about where Blackfriar, Blackfriars Bridge is today, a couple of blocks or so west of St. Paul's. It made a circuit of about two miles. And Westminster was a separate entity altogether. In this picture, you can see a big chunk of the old wall on Tower Hill. The wall as a whole remained largely intact until Elizabeth I's day, and it wasn't finally all pulled down, except for just a few isolated fragments like this, until the 18th century. Some parts were incorporated into later buildings, more modern buildings by that time, and have since been dug out. If you look toward the keep of the Tower of London, as in this picture, from beside that piece of the wall, you can see that it ran just to the east of it, down to the Thames. We'll see the other castles which survive from William's day in a minute, but by far the most famous is the tower which he himself built at the southeastern corner of the old Roman on Saint. Here's an aerial view of the tower now, toward the northeast as it looks today. The keep, sometimes called the White Tower because it was whitewashed typically, is what people think of when they think of the Tower of London, but this term actually refers to the whole castle complex. And of this whole complex, only the keep survives from William's day, and it wasn't quite finished by the time he died. The outer walls with their buildings belong in their oldest parts to the later reigns of Henry III and his son Edward I in the late 13th and early 14th centuries. The keep itself was only rarely a residence even for prisoners. The keep of a castle was sort of the medieval equivalent to a fallout shelter to be used as a place of safety in a time of extreme emergency. The tower has been part of English history for so long that pretty much no matter what period interests you, there's something here that is relevant to it, right up to the Second World War, when Rudolf Hess became the last prisoner to be held here. And we will hear a lot more about it in future classes.
Henry VI was murdered in the Wakefield Tower. Sir Walter Raleigh will be imprisoned in the Bloody Tower. Anne Bullen in the Queen's House. Thomas More and Queen Elizabeth in the Bell Tower. Hess in the Yeoman Jailer's House. The Dudleys and Lady Jane Grey in the Beecham Tower. And the Duke of Clarence was drowned in a wine vat in the Bowyer Tower. And so on. There are basically two kinds of fortress, shell keep, in which the keep is part of the wall, and tower and castle, which is what the Tower of London is. This is essentially a variant of what is sometimes called Mott and Bailey. The Mott is the artificial hill on which the keep is built, and the Bailey is the open space between it and the walls. Here's the keep now at ground level. William and his son Robert had quarreled violently, and so even though he was the oldest, he was not made William's heir as King of England, but only as Duke of Normandy. Consequently, William's second son, known as William Rufus, or William the Red, became his successor. Robert said, in effect, that he didn't want to be King of England anyway, and went off on the First Crusade, in which he played a generally distinguished part. William Rufus, though his younger brother, is considered to have been a stronger personality, more brutal and headstrong like his father, and had long been William's favorite. And the building of the keep here was finished during his reign. It is usually said that the oldest religious architecture in London is the Chapel of St. John in the Tower, which you see now. What is called Romanesque on the continent is usually called Norman in England, and this is consequently the first example of that style. As I mentioned earlier, Land Frank was the man William the Conqueror named Archbishop of Canterbury, and William Rufus appointed St. Anselm, another Italian, to be his successor. Kenneth Clark uses this fact to underline the universality of the church at this time. Today it would certainly be hard to imagine two successive Archbishops of Canterbury being Italian. William Rufus and Anselm didn't always see eye to eye, however, on the matter of the relative jurisdiction and authority of their respective agencies, and the saint had to spend a good deal of time in exile. This is another view of the chapel of St. John in the Tower. Anselm is, in fact, one of the most important figures in medieval theology, to a large extent because he was the first major figure to argue that the existence of God could actually be proven within the limits of reason alone. His argument in the Proslogion, written before he became archbishop, is called the ontological argument. Uh, onto means to be in Greek. And in essence, it goes that God is simply that greater than which nothing can be conceived. And a being with existence is greater than one without it. It's sometimes rendered God is by definition the most perfect being, and a thing which exists is more perfect than a thing which doesn't, therefore God must exist. Regardless of whether this is a sound argument or begs the question by assuming God's existence in the definition of him, it is not an argument which is likely to convince anyone to be a Christian who wasn't already one in the first place. This kind of rational rather than, as it were, faith-based theology was to have a long run in the form of scholasticism, though, about which we'll hear more in a couple of lectures. In the year 1100, William Rufus and his younger brother Henry were with a party hunting in the New Forest, as it's called near London. And about where this monument more or less marks the spot of the event, someone shot the king with an arrow. William had many enemies, and Henry was not accused of crime, although we can judge he was nevertheless not very sorry. Soon after Henry I then became king of England, his older brother Robert returned from his crusade and decided he wanted to be king of England after all. After he botched, in effect, and attempted a second Norman conquest, however, Henry crossed to Normandy with his army and defeated him at Tashbry, the effect of which was to unite Normandy to England, under the king at least on paper. Robert was imprisoned for the rest of his life and died in Cardiff Castle in Wales. The keep on its mott, its artificial hill here, is essentially 12th century, but wasn't here in this form in Henry I's day.
the keep of Cardiff, then, is not quite as early as William the Conqueror's own day, but along with Pevensey and the Tower of London, Colchester, northeast of London, near the coast, is. In fact, a lot of the masonry in this building is said to go back to the time of the original Roman occupation of Britain here in the first century A.D. Henry I's son, William, was killed when the royal yacht, called the White Ship, sank in 1120. And a close friend of the king, Raher, went on a pilgrimage to Rome to pray for the soul of the young man. Raher is sometimes called Henry's jester, his jongleur, but he was apparently much more than just some kind of court clown. In any case, it is said that the death of the king's son sobered him, and the trip to Rome was a personal pilgrimage as well. While he was in Rome, he came down with malaria, and in his delirium, he saw a vision of St. Bartholomew and vowed to build a church in his honor if he recovered. He did recover, and when he returned, St. Bartholomew the Great was undertaken with the help of the king, and a hospital was attached to it, which in 1662 would become the first medical school properly so-called in England. This is the way the exterior of the church on the west looks today. But the most interesting part of it is the surviving Norman section still called Raher's Choir, which you can see now. In London, it is second in age only to the St. John Chapel in the Tower. Henry I died in 1135 without having produced another son, so he attempted to leave the throne to his daughter Matilda, or Maud as she is also known. This arrangement was opposed by his nephew Stephen, the son of his sister, and the French Count Stephen of Blois. Henry's nobility agreed to go along with his attempt to give the throne to his daughter, agreed to go along on paper and before his death, but many privately supported Stephen. And unfortunately for Maud, when Henry died, she was in France, and Stephen and his supporters seized control. This now is Richmond Castle, built by Alan the Red in the north of England, and said to be the fourth castle to survive substantially from the time of William the Conqueror. The High Keep is a 12th century addition, however. Matilda and Stephen now engaged in a long, brutally destructive civil war, which was only ended by her withdrawal to France in 1148. Thomas B. Costain calls Stephen the worst king in English history, but Matilda herself was no saint. Her first husband had been the Holy Roman Emperor, Henry V, who had died when she was still just 23, and she had then been married to Geoffrey Plantagenet, Count of Anjou, by whom she had a son who would become Henry II of England. At the age of 20, he invaded Henry, this future Henry II, invaded England, and compelled Stephen to name him his heir in place of his own sons, who were compensated with large estates. And when Stephen died in 1154, Henry became the first English king of the Plantagenet dynasty. And we'll be back eventually to hear a lot more about him. Next, however, we're going to bring the history of Spain up to about the 12th century. And to do that, we'll need to hear about Mohammed and the Arab conquests. This is a page from the Koran, and we'll begin here after the break. <laughs> 